Hello, and welcome to 10 Minutes with CSA, a series of live virtual conferences about exciting projects and collaborations, as it is the case today, at the Canadian Space Agency. My name is Sébastien Lafrance. I work as a systems engineer for the space science and technology branch at CSA. And today I'll be talking about, uh, to you about Stratus, the C uh, CSA Stratospheric Balloon Program. The Stratos program came from a request from the Canadian scientific community. Um, and CSC started looking at different options to bring back ballooning to Canada and realized that uh, CNES, the French space agency, was looking for a launch site. So we teamed with the, the French space agency to bring the program. Program means we have launches of large stratospheric balloon for science, technology demonstration, and training of the next generation as well. Um, the large, by large balloons, we're talking about balloons that are similar in size to what the Red Bull team used to uh, have uh, Felix Baumgartner jump uh, from um, at the, the high altitude. Um, the program brings annual opportunities in Canada from our launch site, which is located in Timmins, Ontario, but also from sites that are abroad. For example, in 2016, we went to northern Sweden, and 2017, launches were done from the Australian desert. We also have a project uh, that we're looking into right now for, to have a flight that would start from northern Sweden, but that would land in northern Canada. So we're talking about a flight of approximately six days. The Stratus balloon go up to an altitude of approximately 40 kilometers. Uh, if you want some reference points, Commercial aircraft would fly at altitude between 10 and 12 kilometers. And technically speaking, space starts at 100. Balloons are the only way to go and remain for a long duration of time in the stratosphere. Sounding rocket will just go right through it, and satellites, well, they're way above. Different, there's a, many different instruments that are on board those balloons. So in situ measurements are Instruments that in situ measurements are done by instruments that will measure locally uh, the particles that they have in their, uh, their closed environment. Remote sensing or, uh, uh, type of instruments will lo look at particles that are further away. For example, for example, some could be looking at the horizon so that they can look at water vapors or uh, aerosol particles. They could also be looking down so to see what ground, ground, uh, sorry, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, another client, if I could say, for a uh, stratospheric balloon is astronomy. The still telescope do benefit from being above the atmosphere. Look, for them, looking through the atmosphere is just like looking through a thick glass. If you bring them above, you just make that, that uh, glass much thinner and their measurements much more precise. We also use this... Since a, a telescope are large structures that are heavy, this is done at a fraction of the cost of what it would cost for them to go up to space. So big, there's a major savings there. And these savings can also be realized when you test some instruments that are meant to go on, on satellites for, uh, for the way in time, but you, f you start by testing them on their balloon so that they are in a similar environment and you can also uh, validate their mission requirements at the same time, so that when you finally launch that satellite, everything is ready and working properly. Finally, we use these balloons to train and inspire the next generation. The lower launch costs we talked about means also that we have a higher tolerance to failure. We also can accept instruments that are not as optimized as they would be for a satellite. This means shorter development time, and but yet, a, uh, a, it is a representative of a space missions development cycle. So this allows us to have projects with undergraduate students or even high school, stu high school students. And we got a, re a really good example of a high school student project that uh, just last summer. Um, the student, a 14-year-old stu student from the area of Toronto contacted us about a year ago for advice on her science slash physics class project. And well, unfortunately for her, her launch did not succeed because of bad weather. So we invited her to join us in Timmins last summer, where we, launched, we helped her launch her experiment under a weather balloon. And even though we're talking about this much smaller balloon than the large ones we're launching, 
This balloon was able to reach, to almost reach, sorry, 30 kilometers of altitude, it was 29 point something. Um, the experiment was recovered the next day, and um, the student was able to recover beautiful pictures she had taken from the two cameras that were on board her experiment. Now, this was a, a small balloon. If we look at those large balloons, what does it take to fly those large payloads? Well, first, we start with the balloon. We're talking about a zero-pressure zero balloon. This means that the, pre, the pressure inside the balloon equals the pressure outside the balloon. So to achieve this, what we do is, while it's on the ground, we only partially inflate it. As it goes up, the helium will expand and fill up the balloon. If there's any excess helium for any reason, if we inflate it too much for, I don't know, we, we try to measure as precise as possible, it doesn't always happen, we don't want it to blow up. Uh, so there are openings at the bottom that will allow the excess helium just to be released. If we look at the flight train, uh, in the middle of it, there's an avionic gondola. that allows for communication uh, throughout, the, throughout the flight. Also allows us to uh, kind of control the balloon, just similar to a hot air balloon. By releasing helium or um, releasing ballast, you can move up or down and catch winds in, the, in different direction that will all allow you to steer your trajectory. At the bottom of the flight train, there's the scientific gondola. And this is where all the scientific experiments are located. Um, it's hard to imagine, but this flight train with the balloon at the top is about the same height as the Eiffel Tower. So it is pretty large. On a typical launch day, we'll start the day by having a weather sounding. Uh, the, the data from this weather sounding would be fed into the weather prediction models. And those are used to predict the trajectory of the balloon. We've got three tons flying up there. We want to make sure we know where it's going. Um, we're, the scientists on their side will perform the last test on their instruments. And they will also fully charge the batteries. If they have any optical equipment, it's time to clean their lenses. A few hours before launch, the, the flight train equipment is laid down on the ground, all the inter interconnections are done, and they're tested. The, the communication system is also tested. You want to make sure that the link between the ground antenna and the balloon works properly, but you also want to make sure that the link between the, the balloon and the scientific experiment works properly so that everyone can get their data and control their equipment. Balloon inflation will take an hour to an hour and a half, uh, maybe a bit more for larger balloons. And then balloon can be released, so it starts its flight. Uh, one thing for sure is you, you really want to control the time where you will uh, release this balloon as you don't want to hold it on the ground for too long once inflated. The material is really thin and it could be damaged. The ascent itself will last between an hour and a half and two and a half hours, depending on weight and altitude you want to reach. Typically, measurements start at float altitude. Um, some scientists will be requesting for a constant ceiling, so they'll do all their measurements at the same altitude. Others will be asking for a slow descent. For example, for example the institute, uh, institute instruments, they'll want to take samples at different altitudes so that they have a, a larger sampling. Um, they cover a larger area. Um, the flight will last anywhere between 4 and 30 hours. And throughout this flight, the scientists will be able to send commands and will also receive telemetries. Commands will be, uh, could be to turn on a camera, steer it into a certain direction. On this image, you see a telescope. Well, you may want to look at a higher elevation, bring it back down. You could also want to launch a start of measurements. And for, as, for, as far as telemetry goes, well, you, you could want to download an image just like the one we have on the screen. And if, you will, if we look at this image, can you see the atmosphere and curvature of the Earth as well? It's nice to see those. You realize how high you are when you see those. Once the mission is completed, there's a separation mechanism that will separate the balloon from the, uh, the flight train. Flight train will descend on its, on its side under the parachutes on, at a controlled speed. The balloon will be ripped in pieces, deflates, and then falls down as well. Once on the ground, there's a recovery team. Uh, there's a ground team and they're, uh, that's supported by helicopters that will go and recover all of the equipment. Nothing is left behind, even the balloon envelope. Um, 
you, well, we want these equipments to land far away from population for obvious reasons. But therefore, they usually land in forested areas. But on rare occasions, we don't want to talk too much about, we've recovered pieces in, the, in, the, in lakes. So since 2012, 2012, sorry, we've had 25 launches, 31 Canadian experiments, 110 students were trained through this program, and 150 Canadian scientists participated in our campaigns. So this concludes my presentation. I'll now, I'll now go through the questions we've received uh, online. So first question, who takes part in Strata's campaign? Well, like we said, we, it is open to the Canadian community. So anywhere from students, industry, it is open to everyone. There's also uh, our partner, the French Space Agency. They have their own clients. So there's a lot of uh, European scientists that are involved in our campaigns as well. The second question, can you give examples of application of the tests made with these balloons? Well, I think the uh, easiest application uh, for everyone to understand is uh, Google. Uh, everyone knows Google. Um, they, in the past year, they've developed a uh, system to launch these balloons rapidly and launch uh, uh, plenty of these balloons. So they could um, go to a remote area or an area where a disaster happened. They release those balloons with, all, with communication subsystem. Therefore, they can establish locally a, either internet services or just um, telephone services using these balloons. So this is one of the application. Can we use the same balloon for more than one flight? The answer, unfortunately, is no. As soon as the balloon is unfolded, it cannot be reused. It's either inflated and launched or thrown away. And at the end of the flight, to make sure that all the helium is released from the balloon, what we do is we cut it in four pieces. So no, there's, it, it cannot be reused. Is there, um, on the other side, all the flight train equipment can be reused and is reused. Some of it can be requalified and used, not on the next flight, but within the same campaign. Other equipments, other equipments take a bit longer to requalify and will be used in the next campaign. How can we participate and is it too late now? No, it's not too late. Actually, we're in the middle of looking at uh, the payloads for 2019 for our next campaign that will be held in Timmins. So we're looking at application. How can we participate? Through our websites. On CSE's website, Stratas has a web page. And from there, there is a link that will allow you to apply for, uh, for it to, be you, to be launched on our next campaign. If you're not ready, don't worry. This is a uh, collaboration that we've signed for 10 years and we're looking into even expanding it further into those 10 years. So there, are, there will be other campaigns. We now have a question from Instagram as well. Uh, the question is from Manav. Can it escape, can it escape Earth's atmosphere? No, it can't. Um, it can travel really far. The longer you stay up there, the further you'll travel. Uh, but it, no, it cannot escape. At one point, it reaches an equilibrium with the forces, so it won't, will not be able to go higher than a given altitude. I believe the Japanese agency holds the record for going the highest, but I wouldn't know exactly what the value is for this, so I won't go there. <laughs> uh, so this concludes our 10 minutes about Stratus, the CSC Stratospheric Balloon Program. Thanks to all of you connected through Facebook, YouTube, and thanks for your questions. See you next time.